OK, morning, everybody. Um, it's really nice to see people here today, although I can't actually see anyone. <laughs> um, but I'm just here to give you a short little taster, I suppose, of um, some of the material from our module here at the University of Aberdeen on museums and the digital world. And that's an optional part of our MLIT in museum studies. Um, and it's the part that, that I was employed to run. So I don't know really how you perceive museums, but the traditional image of them remains uh, dusty institutions full of objects not hugely into contemporary technology and, and slow to change. Um, and this is often how the people who work in them are perceived as well sometimes. But that isn't really the case, at least not anymore. And I don't think it really ever has been the case in every single museum. So what I want to do here today is take you for a, a whistle stop run, I suppose, through a history of museum engagements with digital technology. And if you have any questions at all, you can ask them at the end. I have a tendency to, to divide the history of museum technology into three rough phases going from 1960 onwards. So in 1963, the director of the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History appointed a committee chaired by a guy called Donald Squires to develop an understanding of the value of data processing for the museum. And by 65, this had become a major study into the potential for computers at the institution. The most important thing as far as this project was concerned was the cataloguing of collections, which was rapidly growing at the time and increasing the standardization of terminology in relation to collections and automation by computer feeds into this really well. In museums, we tend to lump cataloguing and terminology under the umbrella of documentation. Historically, quite an individualistic process. Actually, there are some wonderfully eccentric museum records if you go back far enough. But the 20th century saw an increasing professionalism in the sector and along with advances in technology and the influence of the library cataloguing methods, this led to the adoption of more tightly controlled standards. In 1968, GRIFOS, the General Retrieval and Information Processor for Humanities Oriented Studies, was adapted from library record keeping for museum use. Now, one of the first, if not the first, purposefully created museum information systems was CellGem, created by the Smithsonian and implemented in 1970. This was developed by Reginald A. Creighton and James J. Crockett and was used and distributed by the Smithsonian for more than 30 years, quite a remarkably long length of time. And it was primarily a records management system rather than a modern database, and it was used across multiple institutions, not all of which were museums. Now, quite remarkably, data entry could be completed using pretty much any technology available at the time, including paper type typewriters, teletype, IBM key conches, key to disk data entry, optical character recognition, optical mark sense and personal computers. Not that there were that many of them hanging around. Contemporary museum databases collect all the known information, name, number, age, material, donor, etc., about one object onto a singular record, which you can mostly see on, on one page. Similarly, a cell gem record comprised all the information about one thing, whether that was an object, a publication or a person. These were called logical records and they were composed of multiple physical records, all of which had the same serial number, but which all dealt with a different bit of the object's nature. And while in theory a record could reach 6.3 megabytes in size, that's somewhere between an app download and a 10 minute YouTube video, due to memory limitations, most cell gem programs never reached anything like that size, let alone one individual logical record. Bear in mind, too, that this was all run through the, the museum's singular computer, a Honeywell 2015 mainframe. Now, at around the same time in the UK, John Cutbill and the Sedgwick Project were developing a computing system at the Sedgwick Museum in Cambridge. And this was called CGDS, the Cambridge Geological Data System. The system was used at the Sedgwick, but also at the British Museum's Natural History Division in London. 
Cutbill was also involved as the systems analyst for ERGMA, the information retrieval group of the Museums Association. And this operated between 1967 and 1976, and they worked to develop a standard for museum data recording, which they published in 1969. In line with this standard, a new system called GOSS was developed by the Museums Documentation Association. And it was generally given good reviews by experts and developers, although in a presentation at the 1974 meeting of the Computer Applications and Quantitative Methods in Archaeology Group, long name, Cartbill noted that the most difficult part of the project was not the computing, but the problem of overcoming the inflexible attitudes of traditional archaeologists. And I quote. By 1987, David Williams was calling the adoption of computers by museums throughout the 1960s a commendably rapid response to the relatively new technology for an institution that, as we said, is traditionally seen as rather introverted. And in a sense, this was absolutely true, but it was driven by a variety of factors, including not just technological developments, but the influx of collections, the interest and passion of individuals like Cutbill, and a knowledge of what was taking place in the library sector. And it's really interesting to note that these projects were mainly about utilising computers in areas that museums already had experience in and wanted to make more efficient rather than about rethinking what museums might be. At this point, computerization was a tool for enhancement rather than really development or change. And we can say that this period of initial development and standardization started to come to an end in 1977 with the founding of the NDA, the UK's Museums Documentation Association, which was initially formed by ERGMA. This group aimed to connect collections information across a wide variety of museums, but they also provided standards and documentation practice guidance. And once this was in place and once the new museology, which I'll mention again in a moment, came into action, we can be said to have entered the second phase of museum computing, which really begins around 1980. And that's the phase we'll enter now. Now, 1980 to 1999 was a time of incredible change for computing in the broader social sense, but it also saw a considerable theoretical shift in the attitudes of museums. This theoretical shift was known as the new museology, and it involved the transfer of attention from inward looking collections focused work to a consideration of the potential of museums to have social and political impact, much as we see them doing today. And the period was also one where information storage, as much as object storage, became part of the work of the museum. And around it, the knowledge economy was starting to grow. And nonetheless, the developments began in previous decades related to databases and standardisation continued apace. More and more computers were acquired by museums. By 1983, for example, a whole 28 of the hundreds of museums rather in the UK had a computer. And by 1986, Kew Gardens had a database of living plant collections, which contained over 86,000 records. And recording and standards remained important. In 1987, MODES was launched by the MDA as one of the first collections management systems, CMSs, basically an object database that you could purchase off the shelf. And I used MODES in my first collections management role. Ideas about standards in terminology and practice were also key throughout this period. By 1994, the MDA had launched Spectrum, which is the UK's collections management standard, now in its fifth iteration and used around the world. What about the Smithsonian? Well, there, the new Office of Information Resource Management was inaugurated in 1981, and its main task was to move the computer systems from the now rather antiquated Honeywell mainframe, which had been used to develop Celgem, to a distributed system of computers with multiple terminals and nodes. Unfortunately, however, by 1985, they had become the victim of a series of hacking attempts at the museum support centre, perhaps one of the first cases of a museum hack. And this wasn't just about changing internal information systems, though. It was about making museum information more available to other museums and to the public. 
And this developed in a variety of ways, this, this networking sense. One was the development of networks like CHIN, the Canadian Heritage Information Network, which developed out of the National Inventory Programme in 1982. AMI, Archives and Museum Informatics, also from Canada, was a consultation and training partnership for heritage professionals interested in digital technology. It began in 1987 and leaves a legacy in the sector leading conference, museums and the web. On the other side of the ocean, back here, networks were also growing, including SCRAN, the Scottish Cultural Resources Access Networks, Cornucopia and the People's Network Discovery Service. One really fascinating development in this period is the development of CD-ROMs and thus virtual spaces, which created interesting responses amongst museums. In 1992, Apple Computer launched a virtual museum on CD-ROM, which was distributed to a thousand schools, universities and museums worldwide and presented 3D models of exhibitions that could look something like a traditional museum that, that you might be able to walk through. In 1999, however, the Guggenheim Virtual Museum was prototyped as a museum all of its own using VRML, virtual reality modeling language. It looked nothing like a real world museum at all. And if you hunt around a bit, you can still go and find it online or at least images of it. But CD-ROMs were rather pushed out of the limelight, as you can imagine, by the advent of the World Wide Web. In 1993, the first year the web was in operation, the Museum of Computer Art was founded and virtual and net art suddenly had a home well, and existed as well too. The next year, Web Louvre opened and by the end of the year, approximately 20 pioneers were online. In 95, the Museum of the History of Science in Oxford became the first physical museum to have virtual first exhibitions. And you can still find them online today, actually. The Oxford Science Walk and early photographs are amongst the oldest still online. Websites didn't really become a central necessity for museums until after 2000, however, so these individuals can be seen as super early adopters. And when I first found out how early some museums were engaging with technology like this, I was honestly quite surprised. But let's move on and see what museums have been doing in the first two decades of the 21st century. Now, for some thinkers, in line with the developments that have made the web accessible to and crucially editable by a vast number of people, museum technology use changed rapidly in the 2000s. In the world of Wikipedia and personal blogging, singular experts and singular meanings of objects have given way rather to a space of communication, social sharing and debate. Many these days see the web as a space of conversation, collaboration. And indeed, during the recent dark days of COVID-19 lockdowns, many museums have used the web as a space to continue to make their collections available to as many people as possible. Virtual reality is also starting to take its place in the museum world. In 2018, the National Museum of Finland produced a virtual reality exhibition of one of its paintings, The Opening of the Diet of 1863, in which you could, whilst in the museum, literally walk into the scene depicted in the painting and converse with its inhabitants. That's pretty cool. Huh? Museums are also using the social web, and by that I mean Twitter and Facebook and whatnot, to engage with their audiences, to develop voice, character and personality for themselves. And museums have been on Twitter since at least 2008. Twitter itself arrived in 2006, and they've been tweeting primarily about events and collections, at least in the early days. But as they've become used to the platform, Museums and those who work in them have become more playful and informal, having conversations with each other and with their publics. Events such as hashtag curator battle, which allows museums to challenge each other for the best example of any particular object or type of object. So you think creepy dolls for Halloween, for example, and accounts such as at the Merle and at Museum Bums exemplify this. At the Merle is the Twitter handle of the Museum of English Rural Life, a tiny museum in Reading that, until comparatively recently, had been mostly famous for its displays of farming equipment. 
not your first thought for a Twitter account, really. But in 2018, it tweeted a picture of one of those square Victorian sheep, you know, the kind that look like they've swallowed a widescreen TV with the caption, look at this absolute unit. And with 30,000 retweets and 109.8 thousand likes, it became one of the most popular museum tweets on the platform. And that account became one of the most popular. Sometimes museum Twitter accounts can use this popularity for good effect. Museum buns, for instance, whilst mostly an account celebrating beautiful posteriors in museums, also spends a good deal of its time fundraising and campaigning on human rights issues such as LGBTQ rights. Many museum networks and even museums themselves have begun on Twitter, such as the Vagina Museum, for instance, a museum which campaigns for gynaecological awareness and health. They're fantastic individuals, actually. This all sounds really wonderful an open space of conversation and move from the museum as provider of information to the museum as a discussant in the world of public knowledge. There are two clear assumptions that underlie this though, that the virtual provides both neutrality and accessibility to museums and their collections, but it's never that simple. Museums often retain control over the information that they put out there and limit how much individual members of the public can interact with that information. There's also fear amongst some of something called cyber colonization, in which the provider that you're using for your particular digital services, say website development, has more influence over the presentation and thus the interpretation of ideas than you might like, for instance, through design, structure and online identity. And of course, being online doesn't automatically make a museum visible or accessible. It just increases the platforms on which engagement with them is possible. One still needs particular cultural competencies to unlock the museum. The ability to understand and feel comfortable with its artworks still relies on your knowledge of their meaning, regardless of whether they're presented online or not. It's also suggested that online visitors actually don't differ hugely in nature from those who visit museums in person. And this is perhaps not surprising if museums are simply repeating their existing structures and philosophies online, especially if this is what keeps people out of them. So opening the museum up to the online world doesn't necessarily make it more diverse. I should also point out that the largest number of virtual museums are in the US the UK, Canada and Australia, and that these sites tend to have little provision for non-English speaking visitors. Add to this the percentage of the world who have limited access to the technology required, and we find the online presence of the museum to be perhaps not as freely accessible as we had once hoped. We must of course acknowledge that being available and being accessible are two vastly different things, and that simply putting something online will not make it more accessible to people for whom the idea of a museum, virtual or otherwise, is exclusionary. Well, I want to leave you today with some questions. Um, perhaps you'll answer them here today, perhaps we can talk about them. And what I wanted to ask was this, have you been using museum online offerings during lockdown? Have you liked them if you have? Have you had a fantastic or not so fantastic digital experiences in museums? And finally, do you think the web of today is a hopeful place full of engagement possibilities? Or are you a little bit more cynical? Thank you very much for listening. I look forward to your. So I've had a question. Um, how have the museums at the university digitised? Well, um, I have a wonderful story about this, actually. So you'll know that they're on Twitter, they're on Facebook. Uh, um, Museum Studies course has Twitter and Instagram accounts. So we utilise those to engage um, very much with um, our alumna, staff and external members of the public as well. But the thing I really want to talk about in relation to that question is something quite wonderful that happened with our students actually on, on the MLIT programme. So every year, our MLIT students in museum studies create an exhibition. 
and usually that is uh, put out in the David Wilson, David Wilson? No, crikey, in the library. <laughs> it usually appears in the library. That's the library from my old institution. I do apologise about that. Um, usually put out in the library. Obviously this year uh, that's not going to happen and the students found out about that sometime around the end of March, beginning of April. Usually the exhibition is up in the summertime. It was really difficult for them to find out that the physical exhibition that they had been planning uh, was not going to happen. Uh, but what they were given the opportunity to do was to do the university's very first digital first and at the moment digital only exhibition on something called Omica, which is our online exhibition um, recording system, really, I suppose. And they created between them a wonderful exhibition, which uh, you can go and look at. It's on the exhibitions page. It's called Safekeeping. Um, and it's an extremely timely, or almost weirdly prophetic exhibition um, in the sense that they were um, planning this in November. They decided they wanted to do something about protection, um, about the idea of keeping people and cultures safe. Um, and obviously in March, this became exceedingly relevant and they were able to create an exhibition that tackles ideas of safety and protection with a very light touch uh, towards the, the the real resonance that that has at present. Um, so that's a, that's a really good question actually, thank you and I, I do recommend that you go to the uh, museum's online exhibition website um, and look for safekeeping. It's quite remarkable. How is uh, online museum work incorporated into teaching? Well, um, obviously we had the the online exhibition um, with our students that, that we talked about before. Um, this year it's being incorporated really very heavily here, as you can imagine. Um, Last year I was employed to lead the Museums of the Digital World course, which is where the, the, the short lecture that you just heard came from. And in that I use a number of examples, a number of um, ideas from different institutions around the world in order to talk through a variety of different uh, concepts related to digital. So that's one way in which it's used in teaching. Um, this time around, I'm sorry if you can hear a screaming cat in the background, by the way. Um, this time around, we have really been thinking about how we can incorporate digital elements into teaching. So most of our teaching has been completely digital. We have been uh, occasionally having people go into the museum to look at objects, but that's been uh, very much monitored. Um, what we have done instead is given people access to collections material, collections database, collections information that's online um, via uh, Primo primarily at the moment. Um, and we've also been doing um, extracurricular activities, some of which uh, we are hoping in the future might involve um, more visits to um, places far uh, far throughout the world um, virtually as well. I know that my colleague Neil Curtis has um, taken students, I think, to the Choksaw Nation um, collections. So that's really quite wonderful. Has COVID affected how people see the digitisation of museums forever or do you think it's temporary? I that's a really complicated question and it's one that's going to take a long time to play out, I think. What I can say is that I think the pandemic has forced us into a position 
where uh, when I say us, I'm talking about the museum sector here um, into a position where we need to where we have been required to radically rethink who we are, what we do, how we do it and what it is about us, if anything, that really matters to the general population. So I think there has been um, space for a massive ontological shift that was maybe coming already but has been speeded up by Covid amongst museum staff, particularly younger museum staff and new museum staff and those who are working in um, institutions of radical practice and who are, who are socially engaged, who are socially conscious, who are thinking about the ways in which we can make museums more accessible, more inclusive and more representative of more different kinds of human beings um, and the worlds in which they live. And I think I think this is permanent and I think I think digital will be a part of that. Um, I think the digital has the capacity to offer us a number of tools uh, in order to help deal with the consequences um, of the pandemic, of shutdowns. Um, there are, for instance, um, projects which are ongoing to develop issuable styluses so that people can utilise touch screens in museums without actually touching them. A variety of different technologically focused projects like that. Um, and I think these things are hopefully going to be really useful ways of addressing those bigger questions about museums and who they welcome and who they think they are. And I think that's the most important thing. The thing to remember is that digital is not a panacea. Um, it, it will not solve every problem and it will not solve any problem if you implement it in the wrong conditions or to the wrong purposes. But this is also true of museums in, in general. Museums are a tool for expressing human culture and the ways in which we interpret the world around us. They are not these um, ineffable, necessary things, but they are quite wonderful things. Um, and I think we should I think we should remember that. So somebody has also asked, um, I would like to study museums. Which programmes should I look at? As of course, um, <laughs> but I would say that um, we do run a Museum Studies MLIT uh, programme here, which is a postgraduate taught course. We also run a PhD in Museum Studies, which is relatively new. Uh, we're getting our first students this year and I'm really, really very excited about that. Um, there are many other courses um, around the country, um, each of which have their own particular angles and ideas and advantages and disadvantages um, in terms of of what they teach. So I think the thing that I can say to you is that you need to find the programme that fits your values and your ethos and your needs. Um, and I can't tell you what programme that would be, although I would say, you know, come here. If you want to contact me, by the way, about anything like that, you can do so um, at my email address here, which is jennifer.walklate at abdn.ac.uk. Um, that's J-E-N-N-I-F-E-R dot W-A-L-K-L-A-T-E at abdn.ac.uk. Um, and you can send me an email anytime if you want to talk about particular aspects of the programme and what we do here. And also if you wanted to ask me kind of any other um, tips for courses, the ones that pop into my head immediately are Leicester, Manchester and Reading. <laughs>
yes, Anna's just put my email address in the uh, in the visible Q and A information. Is there anything else that anyone would like to ask? I hope everyone has a great weekend. Other than that, um, I'm done. Just contact me if you feel you would like to do that.